My name is Emmanuel Wachendo, and today's question is, are we in a new Cold War? I'm going to explore this question from the perspective of the aggrandizement of the Chinese state. So China will be an, an important unit of analysis. I will start with realism and idealism in international relations, and then talk about collective defense, collective security, the principle of paradoxical action, rebalancing actions, aggrandizement and resistance, and then end with a look at strategic resistance. In essence, all this will try to make sense of what is going on with China and Chinese state aggrandizement, how nations around China are responding, and what um, and propose uh, use one framework to try and make sense of it and answer the question: Are we in fact in a new Cold War? Realism and idealism in international relations. Realism is a school of thought in international relations that holds that the community of nations is anarchical and without a central authority that nations must answer to, that each state must pursue its own interests, that the interest of each state is the maximization of power, and the theory adds that security and survival are the paramount interests of every state. As such, the state expends considerable efforts to balance relations with other states in pursuit of power and security. The important distinction between the realist and the idealist for the purposes of today is that the idealist look for ways that states can actually cooperate. One, um, one outcome of cooperation is global public goods, right? The co type of cooperation that produces what economists call go global public goods uh, constitute examples of idealism. Specific examples, things like the World Food Program, right? Aid from one country to another. The movement of peoples and, and goods. Now, balancing mechanisms in international relations. Having previously stated that states expend considerable effort in balancing relations with other states in pursuit of their power and security, the balancing mechanisms include collective security and collective defense. Both of these arrangements may impute benefits of cooperation that include access to opportunities for trade and property ownership and citizenship, amongst others, and costs of defection that include barriers to trade and outright aggression. At their very core, however, Collective defense and collective security arrangements are designed to provide security to its members, first and foremost. Collective security. Collective security arrangements are designed to prohibit acts of aggression by committing the totality of members of the community of nations of the world to refrain from acts of aggression except in very limited cases and to consider attacks on any members as a tax on the whole community. When one state's cause of aggression is determined to be unjust, other members of the collective security framework will have reason to attack the aggressor. This is the ultimate deterrent. Finally, the collective security framework must not be designed with a specific enemy in mind. A security arrangement that does not include all the nations of the world exists outside the orthodoxy of a collective security arrangement. The United Nations was conceived as a collective security arrangement.
What about collective defense? A collective defense arrangement involves the mutual defense of member states against a specified member state. Collective defense arrangements are limited in their membership. They are not designed to accommodate the totality of the community of nation states, that is, the nation states in the world. In the post war era, collective defense arrangements are explicitly acknowledged and exist in the open. In the pre World War era, such or period, such alliances could be secretive. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is one notable example of a collective defense arrangement. In principle, the nations of the world were to organize themselves into a single collective security arrangement, such that there would be no need for any collective defense agreements. In practice, this ideal world has not been realized. Paradoxical action. What is it? And what? how does it help us make sense of the world today? The community of nation states is preoccupied with continuous rebalancing actions. Edward Luttwak's theory of strategy builds on realist ideas in general and Klaus Witsian ideas in particular by asserting that the community of nation states is preoccupied with actions of continuous economic, political, and military rebalancing. His mechanical interpretation of international relations has it that nations will pay close attention to the relative economic, political, and military strengths of their contemporaries and their accompanying intentions and then continuously balance against them. Although states differ in their capabilities to monitor, process, uh, to understand, and to respond to the information that signals changing balance of power, they will nonetheless behave in a manner that is suggestive of their perception of where the balance of power lies. An important distinction must be made between the world of military strategy, where actions are driven by a paradoxical logic, and the world of economic and social relations, where actions are driven by a linear logic. In the world of linear logic, expectations of reciprocity are sensible. A restaurateur, right, an individual uh, running a restaurant, does not expect his customers let alone his industry rivals, to respond to the opening of his store with gunfire and explosive grenades. The engineers, civil engineers, for example, do not expect rivers to evade the construction of bridges and move else, uh, do not expect rivers to evade the construction of bridges by moving elsewhere to their embarrassment and loss. The institutions of social traditions and mores, public safety, security, and justice all exist to dissuade, deter, and punish members of society who dare carry out paradoxical actions against society. The husband who surprises his wife with multiple infidelities or his co-workers with blackmail is unlikely to be celebrated by either for his cunning. On the other hand, it is most sensible and rewarding for actors within the domains of military affairs and to a limited extent politics and foreign relations to apply paradoxical logic in their own actions. It is from the intuition of paradoxical action that such phrases as, if you want peace, pre prepare for war, emerge. The institutions of intelligence and martial traditions and credible martial capabilities and martial alliances exist to dissuade, deter, and punish foreign actors who would carry out the sequence of paradoxical actions that would lead to the subversion, annexation, or 
total subjugation of state institutions, private institutions, households, and really all whole nations. The existence of these state functions is a testament to the undesirability of extractive relations between a people of some degree of kinship and the world outside. What about a rebalancing action? In the present day, China has the second largest economy in the world and exports more than the largest economy in the world, the United States. While the nations of the world have long imputed American preeminence in their policy calculus, a wealthy and potentially militarily consequential China is a new data point that they are only beginning to come to grips with. China's relative wealth is enough to trigger suspicion. The response to suspicion is resistance. Resistance manifests in a range of policies from the purely military to the political and the economic, the bureaucratic and the social and other actions outside the institutions of government. As an example, imputing from accessible experiences, say media, the media, the media or the proliferation of Chinese nationals, um, that China is a growing power and out of suspicion of Chinese intentions, locals in a given country may harass Chinese owned firms or other activities with or without the instruction of government officials. In accordance with the principle of paradoxical logic, nothing but the reversal of Chinese economic growth would reduce these suspicions. The best that China could do is look to give as many assurances to the community of nations about its intentions. One example of an assurance is to refrain from military aggrandizement. Paradoxically, military aggrandizement invites resistance. Finally, it is important to note that growing as big as the as China has, you know, the economic growth alone is enough to elicit suspicion. Even without military aggrandizement, the community of nations of the world would be suspicious of any nation were its, econ its, its economic growth to, to reach unparalleled or unprecedented uh, heights. Aggrandizement and resistance. American rapprochement with China began with China's turn away from Maoist economic policies towards free markets. It also in, happened at a time characterized by increasing tensions between China and the Soviet Union. And it was also characterized by American for, foreign policy decisions to deepen relations with China. Under Henry Kissinger's leadership in foreign policy, the United States sought a partner to balance against the Soviet Union. Implicit in their rapprochement was the idea that Soviet non-cooperation would be met with deepening relations with China. Characteristic of this rapprochement was the allowance of public and private American citizens to advise the Chinese state in the organization of free markets. America would invest in the production of goods and services in China. China would organize to obtain American technical know-how through formal exchanges and training and outright theft through means of industrial espionage. The United States also opened its markets for Chinese exports and brought China into the World Trade Organization. The United States is China's most important source of foreign direct investment and is China's most important export destination. 
China is the largest holder, a single holder of American public debt. In what may be interpreted as an intuitive anticipation of resistance to Chinese regional economic preeminence, President Hu Jintao's official senior advisor promoted the conciliatory doctrine of peaceful rise, whose object was to reassure the community of nations that the Chinese Communist Party intended that China's rise will be a peaceful enterprise. The concept of peaceful rise was also designed to discipline party policymakers to keep their policies within the bounds of this commitment. By the period 2009-2010, across multiple policy domains, the content of Chinese policy directives took a notable aggressive tilt. From issues of global financial policy to human rights and trade, the militarization of the South China Sea, territorial disputes, and the value and relevance of Western democracy, Beijing eschewed conciliation for assertiveness, more subversion, defiance, and outright provocation. These policy positions were punctuated with concerning incidents on land, in the air, and at sea, and on diplomatic tirades. Around the world, national and local state institutions are already demonstrating signals of resistance to Chinese economic aggrandizement and its aggressive politics. In the year 2011, Mongolia's government elected to construct a rail connection northwards with the Ch Russian Federation to end at Port Vostokny in Vrangel Bay rather than southwards to facilitate ex exports of low sulfur coal from the Tavan Togoi in the, in the Tsotsetsi Sum district of the Omnogovi province ostensibly to avoid increasing its economic dependence on China. In the year 2010, the Indian government itself instituted a ban on Chinese telecommunications infrastructure. This was significant because in that year, India was the most important destination of Chinese telecommunication exports to the whole world. In Australia, Chinese acquisitions of major raw material producers have been met with prohibitions through administrative injunctions. This, partially to, uh, this partiality to foreign direct investment was not present for American, Japanese, or European acquisitions within the extractive sector or in companies operating in any other sectors. By the year 2011, both Brazil and Argentina had rolled out heretofore, heretofore inexistent restrictions on foreign purchases of significant tracts of farmland and ranch land. Europeans and Americans were longtime buyers of Brazilian and Argentinian farm, farm and ranch land. These restrictions seemed to emerge only when Chinese buyers appeared on the market. Determining trade relations with China were contributing to the deindustrialization of Brazil by undermining, uh, by the undermining of Brazilian light industry, Brazilian legislators sought for tariff barriers against China and the Brazilian central bank itself reduced interest rates to counter the undervaluation of the Chinese yuan against the Brazilian real. A bastion of U.S.-China relations through its emphasis on the value of free trade at any cost, the United States Treasury has itself flirted with similar measures. In its rule FR 45074 of August 2, 2010, the United States Department of Defense prohibited the purchase of munitions from Chinese-controlled sources. The United States government also prohibited imports of telecoms, switchgear, other telecoms equipment, 
and telecoms infrastructure from China by threatening to deny government service contracts to telecoms providers. Whether the response to Chinese aggrandizement is contained within the bounds of geoeconomic resistance or turns into outright confrontation cannot be predicted. Changes to China's present strategic course would, would require the nation to overcome tendencies towards bold foreign policy that is natural for a nation whose economic power is only growing, uh, military expenditures given license by expanding economic wealth, the normal bureaucratic tendencies towards expanding budgets, and public opinion that supports military aggrandizement and may impute past humiliations by foreign powers as part of the rationale in support of growing military budgets. Finally, strategic resistance. Nations neighboring China have already begun to rebalance their relationship in response to Chinese belligerence. While some of the rebalancing actions have historical roots and others are novel initiatives, all of them have a characteristic urgency that suggests a response both to China's growing economic wealth and and perceived belligerence on the part of China. A flurry of interactions between and actions by Vietnam, India, Australia, and Japan, and the Philippines within a span of 12 months in the year 2010 and 2011 provide some important examples of emerging strategic resistance towards China. In that 12 months, India and Japan entered into a strategic dialogue that included reciprocal military school training and education exchanges and intelligence cooperation aimed towards a Chinese threat. Japan also provided aid to Vietnam to bolster its capabilities to counter Chinese maritime intrusions and encroachment. In the year 2011, Australia's Prime Minister visited Japan to discuss an agenda whose explicit aim was to meet a threat posed by China. During that period, the Philippines also strengthened maritime initiatives aimed at defending its own claims to the Spratly Islands. Finally, by the end of 2011, the United States military was itself reorienting its activities in Asia to meet China. At the highest level, this reorientation was supported by the Obama administration's own continued pledge to pivot towards Asia. It should be noted that long before the end of the Cold War, the Pentagon's Office of Net Assessment was just one of many American institutions to have advocated for a pivot towards Asia. Although some actions by State Department officials led by Hillary Clinton and other actions throughout the bureaucratic structure of the American government suggested an instinctive response to Chinese economic and strategic aggrandizement, the intuition was itself prefigured by inter American intelligence assessments dating back to the Cold War years, right? Just to name one. Resistance to aggrandizement is intuitive and can be accompanied by calculation. In sum, for all intents and purposes, the world is in fact entering a new Cold War. It has begun. Now, for nations with weak institutions, nations like many of Sub-Saharan Africa, nations whose civil society don't have uh, uh, enough of the intellectual curiosity or depth to ask themselves these questions, it is 
going to be a difficult time. It is recommended that all these entities start to ask themselves what it means to be in a new Cold War, where nations of weak institutions can surely be exploited more easily. Civil society will have to ask itself what its role will be, why it is important to have strong institutions. They will have to realize that the strength of institutions is dependent on the pressures mounted by the public on those actors whose daily actions actually do form those institutions. Public advocacy is critical. Transparency and ac accountability remain critical, but more importantly, the, the value of the strength in numbers in applying pressure on state functionaries to behave in such a manner that is continuously beneficial to the citizens, that is continuously, co that continuously adds to, multiplies the welfare of its citizens is important. If civil society fails to make this connection, for example, well, a China, a Chinese Communist Party that is, has already stated its explicit position against Western-style democracy will roll back institutions, will roll back constitutions like Kenya's with its 67% approval from the public. We need to keep an eye out. I've been Emmanuel Wachendo. Thank you. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's have a, conversa a conversation. Have a good evening.